And then the main fo fo focus and objective of all this meeting actually is just to drink beer, eat pizza, and socialize a little bit. Uh, I, I mean, we start with a lot of interesting talks today, which is not an extreme exception, but it's not all, all the time the case. But really, for afterwards, if anybody of you wants to stick around, the, the really the idea is to have kind of a couple of people who will be interested in a topic like theory proving, for example, today, to just hang out, chat, get to know a little bit people, different parts of ETH, different parts of Zurich. Maybe there's something interesting you can learn. So I like just knowing, looking over the field, I know about half of you. I think there would be a lot of interesting discussions and connections. I can try to connect some of you later myself. Um, it works a lot better if you kind of paralyze and then <laughs> find who is interesting and then who does interesting stuff. But then we have everything from like almost hardware, electrical engineering side to like formal stuff, blockchains, verification, program synthesis. Um, you'll find someone to talk to, I can tell you. Um, today we're really, really lucky to have three exceptional speakers at our pizza and beer event um, <laughs> who came primarily, obviously, to, to, to talk to us about formal method theory improving and specifically we'll get two, two and a half presentations. So we get a, a long presentation about Isabel um, from Dimitri and Andreas and later on we will have a second presentation um, about Lean from Johannes and yeah, Dimitri and uh, Andreas both have been postdocs and senior researchers here at ETH. Andreas now is still in Zurich, works on, as far as I understood, blockchain um, finance stuff. Uh, Johannes is in um, Amsterdam, now working, I'm not sure exactly how you found it, but you're working on part of the Matryoshka project, more on the mathematical side of things. And so, yeah, before I kind of block all this communication any further, um, I'd like to hand over to Dimitri. So, thanks a lot. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks for inviting all of us. Uh, we'll keep you busy until the evening, such that there will be no, no much space for talking afterwards. <laughs> uh, so the, I called my talk Compile Us with Isabel, but um, I don't um, make myself the illusion to teach you Isabel in uh, 20 minutes, which is what I aim for. Uh, so if you want to learn Isabel, come next semester to our course, which I uh, give together with Christoph Sprenger. And uh, it's a lab course at ETH, uh, like for, for a slot at once. Uh, there's lectures, exercises, and a project at some point. So if you're interested in that, come. Um, compile us with Isabel. I, I thought I will do it uh, as learning by doing, so it's, uh, it will be very interactive. And this is Isabel, so Isabel is a proof assistant and uh, runs here and I can have text uh, things in it so but actually compiler Smith Isabel is not quite true so I uh, for to formalize a compiler in Isabel to uh, I, I would need to formalize two languages and that translation between the two right so that's a bit too much for 20 minutes so I think I will rather go for interpreters uh, and actually not plural but one <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I will, will uh, develop a small interpreter for a language and uh, prove something maybe trivial about it, maybe less trivial. So, what language should I pick? And uh, the constraints that I came up with myself is uh, that it should be low level. Like this is the LL from LLVM. Uh, it should be Turing complete. Um, so, otherwise, it's not very interesting. Uh, what do we want to do with the non-Turing complete language, right? And, uh, well, what else? It should be doable in 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, what what is left? Like, oh, which language could, could I take? <laughs> which language is in the intersection? Any suggestions? Except for those from those people who know already what I'm going to do. Uh, what I mean by low <laughs> uh, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so, but maybe you have uh, an idea of what low level could mean. And, uh, yeah, that's too high level, actually. <laughs> yes, I, I do not assume, I mean, there will be some familiarity with uh, functional programming helpful, but uh, I wanted to have something more imperative. So, what is the imperative? 
the counterpart of lambda calculus. Well, it's Turing machines, but we can do a bit more high level. Um, so what I will do is, uh, is a brain fog interpreter. <laughs> uh, who knows brain fog? Okay, so at least the goal after this uh, 20 minutes is maybe you do, will not know Isabel, but you will know brain fog. <laughs> so the syntax of brain fog, uh, I have to delete a lot of white space, is actually pretty easy. And this is how I define it in Isabel. I tell Isabel I have a type which I think of as the syntax of brain fuck, and there are six simple commands, oh sorry, five. I omitted one, but actually there are six, but for simplicity I omitted one. So what can we do? We can increment, we can decrement, we can output, we can go left and right, and we can loop. What does it mean? Well, brain fuck operates on an infinite tape, and on that tape you have a pointer, you can walk left and right, and you can increment the values in the tape or decrement them. And looping means you check whether the current value is zero. If it's not, you execute the loop. Uh, if, it's, if it is zero, you skip the loop. This is uh, kind of breaking. Uh, so what I've described informally, let's uh, do it formally in Isabel. Let's program the semantics of brain fuck in Isabel. Uh, so what I want to do is, uh, I want to do it in three steps. So first we need to say what uh, the brain fuck program operates on, what is the state of the program, and then I will have a step function uh, where I so far only wrote the type and I should say, ignore the quote. It's, if you see quotes on the page, those are not strings, but this is just a separator for Isabel to separate types from other things that are around. So this is just, I'm defining a function step that has this type. Uh, so the type, uh, the function takes as input a list of such commands. So actually our programs will be not just one BF, but a sequence of, a finite sequence of uh, um, atomic things. Uh, and um, a state, and we'll return, we'll process a bit the sequence of commands and we'll return uh, the, the remaining commands to be processed and the state. So this is like only one step. Uh, if, you, if you want, it's a small step semantics to, that I will program as a function. And then eventually, I want uh, to run the function, so I start somewhere at the tape, uh, which has zeros everywhere, and I want to execute the list of commands, and uh, this execution may not terminate, so it's Turing complete, right, I have arbitrary loops, so the, uh, the program can run around the tape and never come to an end, so in this case I will return nothing, so the, uh, I use an optional value to, di to indicate that I may not terminate. And if I return something, then I will return a list of integers. Uh, and those are the uh, things that the program has modified during its finite execution on the infinite tape. The value, uh, sorry, uh, not, not, the, uh, not what it has modified, but what has been output. So the command actually outputs the integers. This is like the content of your console, if you want. So what is the state? I told you it's an infinite tape and the pointer into a tape. So let's start with the pointer. And I will use a record type for that. You can think of it as a C struct or something like that. Uh, so it has a uh, current pointer. I will call it, call it tape cur. And its type should be just an integer. So I operate on a tape of integers. Now I want an infinite tape to the left of the pointer and an infinite tape to the right of the pointer. So tape left should be like an infinite sequence of integers. Let me call this stream. I have not defined yet what stream means, that's why it's red, but in a second I will define. Uh, and on the right uh, I have also a stream. So, and whenever I output something, I also need to record it. This is the uh, console. So I will record it as a list of integers. Those are the things that I output. And I need quotes for that. Ignore them again. 
So what are streams? Um, if you worked with Haskell, you, you know that lists in Haskell are actually infinite things. Um, in Isabel, it's uh, slightly different, but we, we have also means to define infinite, infinite sequences. We can just say it's a code data type, right? So um, a stream is just some constructor, let me call it also stream. Uh, and the arguments of the constructor are an integer. This is the head of the stream and the tail of the stream. So uh, those will be infinite sequ sequences that I will use. And I will use some nice uh, infix syntax um, for the streams, namely this one. Um, this means I can write something like well, it's actually not that easy to write something because I need to write an infinite, uh, infinite thing, right? So I could try to write, okay, zero followed by one, followed by two, followed by three. Uh, I need to make it right associative, I think. Ah, no, okay, yeah, I'm just not done, right? So let's put a variable there. We can fill it with something. So that, that's an infinite stream. The access will also be an infinite stream, will uh, continue forever. Uh, but actually we will um, not use the fact that the streams are uh, very infinite. I just uh, played with it for demonstration purposes. So, But let me define one particular infinite stream, namely the stream of zeros. This will be our initial state. Um, so in zeros is just zero followed by well, zeros. Just a recursive, def core recursive definition actually. Um, so we can do that. Uh, we could try to evaluate, ah, before we try to evaluate, I wanted to give, give the name to the head and the tail of a stream. And there is some nice syntax in Isabel that you could have in Haskell as well, if you know the Haskell data types. Um, so you can say uh, this is the head and this is the tail of the stream and what you actually get from Isabel is the function head that has time in the type stream goes to end. But the stream give me the first element. Now we could try to uh, see what the value of zero of the head of zeros is. Right? This will not work. So uh, it doesn't terminate. There is like a stack overflow because it, try, uh, it does eager evaluation, tries to construct the infinite stream of zeros and then take its head. But fortunately, there is some. Uh, uh, there was some bachelor thesis that Andreas has supervised, and it's actually now in Isabel. So you can tell Isabel to evaluate streams lazily. And then it will work, and the head of zeros is zero, and so is the head of the tail of zeros, and I could go on. It will always be zero. Okay, so now we have our state type. Now we need to say how do we evaluate the commands, right? The sequence of commands. And um, for that I will do, I will pattern match on the sequence of command, and in particular on the first command that I see in the list. Uh, so let's start actually with the case where I don't have any command at all, uh, namely CS, where CS is the empty list. Well, then I'm kind of done, but uh, I denote it by not changing anything. I just return the empty list and the unchanged state. But in the case where the first command is there, so the list is non-empty, and this is the syntax for a non-empty list, you have the first command, for example, uh, ink. ink is the simplest one, followed by some remaining commands. And the state, then what I will return is the pair of the remaining commands. So I will execute ink. And executing ink means incrementing the current pointer, right? So this will be just the state. And we have some nice record update syntax I have to type a bit. Um, tape cur uh, is tape cur 
of the old state plus one. And I missed, ah, I need an assignment uh, instead of equality here. So this will increments the content of the tape by one, right? So decrement is very easy because I just need to replace the plus by minus. What is more interesting is uh, going left or going right. So let's go left first. What is the new current pointer when I go left? What did left do? Left goes to the left. <laughs> <laughs> so from you in that direction. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, basically when you go to the left, you, you look at the left part of the tape and take its head. So it's the head of tape left uh, of the state. But we also need to update the, uh, no, the tape, right? So the tape left part now gets shorter well, not actually short, it's still infinite, but uh, we just take the tail of the of tape left, of the old tape left, and for the right part, uh, well, we take the old right part, and we make it longer by prepending the current, the old current value. Okay, so this is going left, now I need also to go right, uh, and there I basically need to change left and right, I think. Um, this should be left, I hope it's correct, but we will see. <laughs> uh, and. We can also output things. Step out CS state. Well, then we don't change the tape content when we output things, but we change the output of the state. So it will be the state. I did not want to type those things again. Uh, out is the, oh, the old output, and I put the new thing at uh, the front. So it will be the current tape content. Uh, so uh, I, I told you before this is the list constructor of uh, Isabel and uh, yeah, I used a similar notation for the stream constructor. Uh, okay, so what have I missed? Well, the loop, the most interesting thing. <laughs> Um, so now we can look at the loop command. The loop has as an argument a sequence, again, of BF commands, right? So let me call it ds. So now our sequence of commands starts with a loop and then is followed by some, some other commands. How do we execute a loop? Well, we look at the content of the current, the, the current cell, the pointer. And we check whether it's zero, right? Tape or state zero. And then if it is zero, we terminate. So we, we skip the loop, basically. But this means we just continue with uh, CS, which were the remaining command and the unmodified state. Uh, however, if it is not um, zero, we execute the loop, and executing the loop means uh, re uh, calling step recursively uh, with ds in the state. What we get out of calling uh, step recursively is a sequence of commands es and the new state. And uh, here we continue, right? So uh, we will return, sorry, in uh, the new state. And what sequence of commands? Well, we certainly will need to execute CS still, and potentially we will need to execute the loop again when we reach it, but the first thing that we need to execute is ES, and this is list concatenation, the ad that I just wrote. 
So you're you're 15 minutes into the talk, by the way. But a yeah. question: So why do we even do a recursive call here? Well, I could get the um, uh, first command of the list, right? But my commands are not just lists; they are more deeply structured. Yeah, but you could just say, okay, yeah, we, we're we're putting loop there. We're we're just saying it's yes, uh, as prepended to loop the as prepended yeah. to C as without doing the recursive call. Execute the first thing in the loop body, pop it off. No, oh, that's true. Keep going from there. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I did not mi minimize that. Yeah, you're right. I thought that's nice to have some recursion. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you, you have to unroll the loop, so it's ds add loop ds. Yeah. yeah. And the state is the same. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so since I'm 15 minutes into the talk, let me copy some things. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, this one I can write. Uh, so now I have one step. Now I need to iterate the step uh, until it. Uh, terminates or, do, or does not terminate. <laughs> so for that I have a combinator in Isabel which is called the while option combinator. Uh, let's look at its type. Uh, the type says, uh, so uh, A is a state on which it operates. This is the state update and uh, you iterate the state update until the predicate says true. Uh, while the predicate says true, when it says, uh, says false, you stop. And when it never says false, then you return uh, none. Uh, anyway, so let uh, let me iterate. So, what is my uh, termination condition? Well, actually, oh, well, what is my state? My state will be uh, commands, the the sequence of commands and the state. And uh, the termination condition is that the sequence of commands is empty. So here I need to write the negation. Uh, the step function is the step function. Well, what a surprise. And uh, I need some initial value, right? So I promised an initial value. Let's define the initial state. Um, So the initial state has zeros everywhere. And uh, has no output. Okay. Uh, so the initial this is this initial state, but I also have a sequence of commands that I want to run, so this will be also part of my initial state. Now the type is not quite correct, so this gives me back a pair, an optional pair of a, a sequence of command and the state. Uh, so let me keep the option. I will use the map function that is there for option, for the option type. Uh, but uh, get rid of the pair. So now I have only the state. I don't have a sequence of commands anymore. Um, and of the state, I want the output, and this is function composition. Um, uh, so, and uh, from the output, I, yeah, no, that's what I want. Yeah, it has the right type. <laughs> Looks good. So, let now the function is called run, right? So, that's not a co coincidence. Let's run it. I have written a parser. Uh, because my, my syntax is structural, but uh, I want to write something like that, right? Plus, minus, which are the actual brain fuck syntax. <laughs> is the actual brain fuck syntax? So let's skip over the parser. It's not really interesting. It's a, a push down automaton, basically, <laughs> the parser. Now I can uh, parse my examples, right? So this is not something I wrote. This is something I found on the internet, and apparently it's a hello world function so we can run it right and if you are good with ASCII you <laughs> will recognize that this is hello world 
Uh, actually, yeah, I forgot one thing. So it's not hello world, right? <laughs> because I'm prepending the characters to the output instead of appending them. So let's change our semantics a bit. Let's reverse here. Okay. Now I can run the thing. And now it says hello world. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so my semantics is right. <laughs> I mean, otherwise it would be insane <laughs> to, <laughs> that this program gives the right output. Um, <laughs> I mean, there are some, some shorter versions of Hello World. I pasted them here. There is, this one is even, even shorter, I think. It looks longer, but it's only one line instead of two. Uh, it also returns Hello World. Uh, I, I think it omits the... Ah, it has a comma instead of... Uh, um, new line at the end. So maybe that's why it's shorter. I have another command, uh, another hello world, which actually does not terminate. I find it, found it also on the internet. Uh, so that's a bad sign, right? Because uh, with actual brain for compilers, it does terminate. So I, I looked it up what the issue was, and it turns out that some brain for compilers wrap around when they do um, increments. So we worked here with perfect integers. They can be arbitrary, get arbitrary large. But if we do something like mod uh, 256 um, for both, uh, then we get this command to run. Okay. So um, yeah, I'll skip over the loop because I also want to show some proofs. So Isabel, uh, so far I only defined things, right? But uh, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I think I will go over the proofs quite quickly by pasting them. I did the proofs, of course, beforehand. So uh, I, I was uh, thinking quite a while, what can I prove about the BrainFuck program that is easy? And the thing I came up with is that uh, in, in uh, the way I defined the uh, BrainFuck programs, uh, you can swap left and right. And it does not matter. If you consistently swap left and right, your program will have the same output. So this is my swapping or flipping uh, function. Uh, but uh, this one has to be recursive, I guess. <laughs> uh, and this is the lemma I want to prove. So I want to prove that the um, when I um, swap the, co the commands, apply swap to the commands, then I uh, get the same output. But it's not affected. Um, well, how do I prove this? Uh, obviously, I will need to unfold the definition of run. There is no way around it. And uh, whenever I write a lemma in Isabel, I get proof state. So this is what I have to prove after I unfolded the definition that the two options uh, two while option loops are somehow synchronous where in one case we start with this thing and in the other case we start with something else. Unfortunately, there is a very useful lemma which I proved during my PhD for a different reason about while uh, option that will allow me to, to prove this thing. So the lemma is called while option commute. Um, Sorry, this is the lemma. So it says um, you have two while loops which are slightly different, right? So you have a different test and a different um, different step function, and you have some function that uh, you apply to the initial state of one of the loops, and uh, you, you start with a modif unmodified state of uh, the other loop. So if you can kind of push the function through the step function, uh, always rotating a C prime with F and getting a C out of C prime. Yeah? Syntactically, what does the, the question mark. S or the question mark be actually? Yeah, so th those are variables where I can substitute for bigger terms. I, yeah, I should have said, uh, everybody asks about the question marks, but I should have uh, wrote in it, uh, written it like this, and then it looks a bit ugly, yeah, but there's no question marks, <laughs> and the question is, yes? Hmm? 
they are named holes. They are named holes, exactly. Yeah. But synchronized holes, right? So whenever you substitute something for B, you will substitute it everywhere for B. Um, right, so I, I will use this lemma, but I will need some auxiliary lemmas to prove this. And maybe I show one auxiliary lemma, which I want to develop together with you. Um, so I want to um, know what happens when I apply step, not run, but only once to a flipped um, uh, list of commands. Can I somehow express it in terms of applying step to the original list of commands? Not flipped. Any suggestions? So let's try. Um, we just uh, do apply it to the unflip step. Uh, unflipped list of commands. We get out a new state and a new sequence of commands. And now what do we do with this? Exactly, we need to swap the tapes in state prime. I will call this flip state. And we also need to swap the commands. <laughs> So, um, what is flip state? We need to define it. Uh, it, where it takes a state, obviously, and swaps left and right. So it will be state updated with a tape left is the previous tape right the state and tape right is tape left the state I forgot the colon okay so yeah I uh, had more fun proving this lemma when my definition was inductive because I needed the induction, but actually um, I will still still need the induction because I want um, to pattern match on CS exactly in the same way uh, the I pattern match in the, fu in the function on CS. Cases. Yeah, yeah, that also works, but I will still use induction. Uh, so I will say SST rule uh, step induct. So actually what happens is that the function packet generated a induction rule for me that fits the definition of the function and everything will be nice if I apply auto to this definition. <laughs> Something went wrong, right? Yeah. You need to apply flip state as a state of the civil step. Because we need to flip the state twice uh, as the argument of the seventh step. So, no, I think the lemma looks no, good to me. Right. It should be map flip D as right. Ah, uh, yeah, that that's true. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, still not quite. Oh, there are the mods. Yeah, I forgot. Unfold, flip state, right? Exactly. So the Isabel does not unfold definition by by default. So I have to tell her to use the definition or unfold it rather. Uh, and there is still something. Yeah, it um, states wrong. Yeah. Take left. Oh, the first one at least. Um, let me check. It was so easy. I know you have this mod two two five six. No, ah, no, okay. The the comment was right. <laughs> yeah, I uh, have to run it also on the flipped state because left and right does not mean the same thing, right? So I need to flip the state before I run it. 
I get some output and I, now I need to undo the change that I did. So that should be better. Yay. <laughs> so let me do this, transform this into a one liner. That's a lemma we proved. Step flip. I think the name doesn't. I will register it as a simp rule, which means it will be unfolded or applied uh, whenever possible. I will need some more lemmas, but I, let me just copy them from this. Those are my lemmas. Uh, they are fairly trivial, uh, actually. Well, I, I, they work just by unfolding definition, like applying flip state uh, to init. Um, gives you in it and I was even too lazy to write down the definition so I called sledgehammer which is an automatic tool that tries to prove lemmas and it found this proof right so then I clicked on it and that's that's how I proven those <laughs> auxiliary lemmas and now for the final one let me copy it as well it uses the um, the promised um, theorem that I showed you, but uh, show it in two steps. So this happens when we apply the theorem, we get three sub goals. Those are the sub goals. I think this one is trivial, and those are the um, the two sub goals that remain. Uh, that the first tells about the test function, says that you can apply the uh, function, you have two test functions, right? And you can apply one test function. Um, you, you can apply your transformation between the two while loops to one of them and get the same result. And uh, the second sub goal says that the step function commutes with the transformation that you apply to the states. And the transformation that I applied to the state is, by the way, this one. So it's kind of flips the state and flips the commands. Uh, and then the proof is again automatic. We are done. I think I want to leave some time to Andreas to talk also about more complex stuff. So this was just an intro how Isabel works. <laughs> oh yeah, let me take it. Ah, uh, the microphone? Ah, uh, the microphone, yes. Um, the... Which is the switch? Uh, three. Three. Uh, three. Oh, no, uh, one. So I was one. three. Oh, there it is. Three. Uh, yeah. 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 So, should we switch them? Uh, okay. um, mm -hmm. uh, it's one. Yeah, All right, so, um, yeah, thanks for, for coming. Uh, I didn't prepare such an interactive thing because I wanted to zoom out a bit uh, in, in that level um, about, about compiler verification. And it is about a bit of my background. So for my PhD, I looked into multi-threaded Java, formalized a big semantics, and a, well, toy compiler for the subset that I formalized that compiles Java source code into bytecode. And that was proven uh, correct with respect to the Java memory model, and I hope that by the end of the talk you will have an idea of what the proof uh, was all about. So, um, what Dmitri already told us, so yeah, please interrupt if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, if I'm going too fast, too slow, uh, if it's too boring, whatever. So, uh, what Dmitri actually tol uh, showed us was, well, a semantics for brain fog, which felt something in between an abstract state machine because we had a state and we had basically instructions that, that, that turned that around and something which is, is commonly called the small step semantics. So we, we have individual um, execution steps. Um, 
Normally, small step semantics, so if, we, if we're strict about it, um, it, it has a very traditional format of, of doing sub-expression evaluation, but so for brain folk, we don't really have sub-expression, we don't have a tree, okay, we have the loop, but for the loop, we do the loop unrolling, and that's also characteristic property of the small step semantics. Um, in terms of uh, compilers, I mean, my work, the Ginger Strats work, um, isn't the only one that did a compiler verification. We have very impressive works out there, the ComCert compiler, which is a completely verified compiler for a subset of C written in Coq that's also based on a small sub semantics. Um, there's KKML uh, done in Hall 4 by people mostly from the UK. Um, they did this in the whole four theorem prover using a functional big step semantic. So in comparison to a small step semantic, which does very, 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 very little steps, but loads of them, a big step semantics does everything in one go. So you only have to talk about the initial state and the final state, and the rest is all straight through. They have a version that, that does it in a functional way, similar to what Dmitri had written. Um, but there's also a relational way to, to write down the semantics. Uh, advantage of big step semantics is, well, you don't have to reason about the intermediate states because you don't have them at your hand. The drawback is you can't reason about the intermediate things. Um, right, and then there are denotational semantics um, where, where you take a more, well, well, an even more abstract approach um, to the whole thing. But I'm not aware of any major compiler being formally verified um, with respect to a denotational semantics. Um, what I'm referring to here is the whole imp, or what I'm using to demo the difference, is the whole imp development that's part of the Isabel uh, standard library. It's being used by the Isabel, well, one of the main Isabel developers, Tobias Nipko, uh, in his semantics course at TU Munich. Um, it's a small language uh, called imp. It's a wild language. Um, so you have assignments, if conditionals and whiles, and sequencing, and that, that's all. And well, the big step semantics, um, here we see the type. It's, it's written as this double arrow to the right. I, I think I can turn it a bit bigger if you don't, in the back have, so it should have a better chance to actually see it. So it takes a command. That's basically the brain fact analog of, uh, no, the, the while analog of the brain fact. Um, list of instructions. It takes a state which in the case of a wall language is an environment um, meaning a map from variable names to the integers to the value that's stored there and well this is a relation so it returns basically a predicate ab about success states or alternatively you could consider this as the characteristic function of a set Name the set of successor states, and the successor state is ready to what it evaluates in the end. So that's the big step thing. Uh, in comparison, the small step has the same input state, but the resulting output state, just like in the brain fog example, contained basically the rest of the uh, semantics, namely uh, the rest of, of the program uh, that, it, that was rewritten, the rest of the list that we're working through, and th then we can iterate the whole thing. And if we, if we go to something more functional, the, say if we have some, just an instruction program, there we would have an instruction list that is not modified. This is more like how we think of processes running uh, our assembly programs in memory. The program in memory is immutable. Well, at least that's a very common abstraction. So that stays there. Then we have basically a program counter, the environment, and a stack, and that is transformed from one step into the other. And just as Dmitri said, okay, showed, well, we can do these small step semantics and then um, iterate them until we get to, to some termination, record output in between. Um, that, that all just, just works out the same way that, that we do. We don't really have to, well, decide what we do with non-termination. So Dmitri already showed us about uh, those uh, streams being infinite objects. So we can also think of, well, if the program does some observable behavior in between, 
we don't really have to say, okay, there's nothing, there's none as the output of the uh, running things in wall. You can just collect all the out intermediate outputs and then would return a stream of outputs instead of that. So that's, that's possible. We can have those semantics by looking at them. So the big step semantics traditionally looks uh, roughly like that. Um, so there's a skip statement that doesn't change the state. There is the uh, assignment that updates the state according to the uh, evaluation function of the arithmetic expression. Sequencing is the interesting things, and this is why we don't see in the result um, any, no, any trace of the intermediate state S2. That is the result of evaluating the first thing that is immediately fed into the second thing, and the result thereof becomes the output of it of the whole evaluation and then that's, that's the inductive definition. And for, for the while thing, um, we just do the recursion similar to what, what Dmitri had in mind. Um, we see the unrolling much better in the small step semantics where the while is turned into an if, b, then c, and repeat the while, right? So we first do the body, and then we do the loop again. And if, it's, if the condition is falsified, we just do a skip. And in a sequencing, when the first thing is a skip, we throw it away, the whole sequencing, and just continue with the rest. So that's the characteristic of a small step. And if we don't have a skip at the beginning, well, if we have anything at the beginning that can still execute, then we have these sub-expression reduction rules. That's the characteristic of a small step. What we, of course, can do then is do a proof that the big step semantics and the small step semantics are actually equivalent. That's something you would do in a programming language theory course. Um, in a compiler course, you would rather say, OK, let's write a compiler right? that takes such a command and converts it into an assembly program of instructions and say, what kind of instructions do we have? Well, we'll probably need to do uh, variable lookups. Uh, no, constants, variable loads, add two things on the stack, store the top of the stack under variable, and the usual jumps for um, doing, uh, well, yeah, conditional jumps for control flow. And then you already see there's a stack. The configuration consists of a program counter, a state, and a stack, and so on. That's all there in the standard library. You write this compiler, and then you want, maybe want to prove their compiler correct. And this is what, why, why I'm, I'm here all about. So what does it actually mean to have a correct compiler? Suggestions, ideas. Yeah? Once it's compiled, you don't exhibit behavior that were not in the original program. OK. So that means if I have uh, here my source program C that I then compile down uh, is that readable or do I, yeah I'll, I'll write bigger okay so here's my program com that goes down to some instruction program using the compiler right and that thing executes in my instruction semantics um, to some, and that ex exhibits some behavior, right? And what you're saying is now, okay, I want this behavior to be equivalent to some behavior up here, such that the compound executes, and, and this is essentially what, what we want to do in a, a proof. Is that what you said? Yeah, more or less. But from what I understand, it's not deterministic your program in language here. Yeah. Well, no. determinism is, is a big, big issue here. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah. So what we're actually proving, doing, is a simulation proof from that the original program can simulate any behavior of the compiled program. And because the upper is simulating the lower. That's called an upward simulation proof in the literature, right? Uh, 
That's actually the correct thing that we want to prove. Absolutely. That's the normal condition. Um, so this is going proving an inclusion in that direction that those behaviors are included here. So we have a refinement. Now, the comment was already right, but what about determinism or non-determinism? So from a non-determinism perspective, we have a relational semantics, so we don't know up front that it's deterministic. Um, so this can have many behaviors, and the compiler is free to pick one of those. It's like when you compile your C program and it has implementation-specified behavior, then the compiler can pick one of those, and it still runs. For the wild language that we have, we actually don't need that. Uh, the wild language is actually deterministic. What that means is, well, up here we can have just one behavior at most. I mean, if the program doesn't terminate, using a big step semantics, we will have no behavior. Then, yeah. Um, but so we have at most one behavior up here. Um, so what we can do in that direction is actually to prove that we prove a downward simulation. We prove that this behavior is, can actually be exhibited by that instruction sequence. I want to, if we're just having too much time, we can actually prove both, try to prove both directions. Then the compiler doesn't change the behavior at all. It um, can also be interesting for, for, for certain properties. Um, but these are basically the two directions. So if we have a deterministic target semantics, then we can do a downward simulation in order to get upward simulation, which is what we're actually after. Now, for many languages, the downward simulate, or for many uh, compilers, the downward simulation is much easier to prove than the upward simulation. The reason for that is the same reason why the big step semantics is sometimes more useful than the small step semantics for these proofs. Because you just have less detail at the abstract level. Right? So typically, if we look at the instruction thing, well, we had those jumps that are there, um, all, this, all this control flow stuff that we do. And if we think about compilers that, doing, that do register allocation, spilling, and all that stuff, well, that's all the behavior that is here. We don't, we don't really care about that at this abstract level. But if we do this very simple simulation proof where we just try to prove, OK, if this thing does one, one small step, then that thing up there doesn't change. Then we have to look at all those small steps. Whereas if we get, just go downwards, we have those big steps up here that translate into many small steps, but we don't have to look at the intermediate states anymore. So that makes our simulation relation easier, and um, that's what's, what can be done. Um, what does that mean? So the downward direction that I already mentioned. Yes. Yeah? Is there a notion of behavior for a non-terminating program? Sorry? Is there a notion of behavior for a non-terminating program? Um, so that really depends. Um, you can have a behavior. Right, I mean, you can say, okay, if the big step semantic doesn't terminate, then you don't want to, the instruction sequence to not terminate. If, if, if you do that kind of proof, then that gets you this equivalence back. Yeah. Um, you can also explicitly model, uh, explicitly distinguish between non termination and the semantics going, getting stuck. Um, that would be. A different thing, if you do it that way, your big step semantics usually becomes ugly. Um, and that's why the KML guys switched to essentially a functional big step semantics. Because as far as I remember, that allowed them to, to oh no, sorry, I'm mixing things up. No, they didn't. Um, it was it was a bunch of cockeye guys who, who, had the, uh, who had a nice big step semantics that could deal with, with infinite behavior. Um, there were attempts to define the big step semantics co-inductively such that you would um, encapture also the infinite behavior, but that has other problems. Um, essentially, you don't, you don't want to have diverging computations than in your big step semantics um, because that would just 
break your progress property. Right. So for those who just understood nothing, forget it. Um, just internal discussion between Alex and me. Um, right. So downward simulation, as I said, if we have a behavior in the source code, then also the compiled code exhibits a certain behavior. So starting from an initial state, we end in the final state with corresponding uh, output values and you know, change stack in that case. Um, there's also proof that goes the other way around. If you have an ex a complete execution of your compiled code, then you get that. And for this very simple while language, the compiler doesn't do any interesting. There's no non-determinism to be refined, so we get an if and only if here. And that basically relies on this property of the big step semantics being deterministic, which you can express nicely as well if I have one evaluation result t and another evaluation result u, then they're actually equal. So, of course, we have to talk about what is actually the observable behavior when we want to verify a compiler. That's what we care about. Um, in particular, do we, want, do we consider termination to be observable? Or is that something that's not observable and therefore we collapse everything into a non, as Dmitri did? Or do we want to have a stream of output events that, that we want to talk about? Well, usually the result is certainly things, um, the input output. But if you think about a multi-threaded program, if you want to do your compiler verification thread locally, you maybe want to preserve certain memory access patterns. And therefore, you, sh you should make your memory access actually observable. And that means, well, your compiler proof, correctness proof will be more work because you have to prove that more things are actually lining up. Um, that's essentially what, what happened in, in my um, proof. Yeah, we've already covered refinement or semantic preservation and this really nice theorems. So we can also ask, well, how do we actually prove the, the compiler correct? And this is, again, feeling a bit like a, 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 a lecture. Um, there, there are basically two approaches in the literature so far that I've, I've came across. Um, one thing, which is the obvious thing, you just proved that damn thing com named compiler correct once and for all, and whenever you run it, you will know that your theorem applies. Um, that works well for these um, simple compilers for a while language, or compilers that don't do non-trivial optimizations, because there you're, you have a pretty good understanding of what is actually happening. But then there are things where you say, and this is what the compiler guys usually uh, spend their time on. Now we want to write a very, very clever register allocator. Or now we want to um, do a very, very clever loop optimization um, technique. Verifying that in a formal way is something that can take very, very long. And actually, well, this very complicated algorithm, we, 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 don't, we don't really need to know all the details of why it is correct. It's enough that, well, we can fairly easily see whether the register allocation is correct or not, right? So once you're given that and you get the program and you see, oh yeah, actually this, this makes sense, this works. It's just a few checks on that, that you don't assign register double and that you move things around as, as needed. But how you arrived at that solution is something you don't really care about from a correctness perspective. It's a matter of how fast your code will run in the end, but speed was not about, uh, among the observable behaviors that we cared about. <laughs> but, but then you need to verify every compiler. Right. And that is what is, is uh, typically called translation validation. So you run upon every, whenever you run the compiler, you actually have programmed a check that implement, that, that checks the specification, say that the register allocator is correct. And then you, you just run that and you can use an oracle that gives you that. Uh, the CompCert people and the KML people are using that quite a bit, just in order to get really state-of-the-art algorithms into their compiler pipeline uh, without 
spending years on verifying them and proving them correct. Because in case, well, they're incorrect, well, then that basically means the compiler says, well, I can't compile your program. Sorry. So it's a matter of, of, of service quality. Yeah, and so just to, to, tell, to show you that this is actually something that, uh, well, I really have done. So there is a compiler. So this is uh, from Ginger Threads, my, my PhD thesis, available on the archive of formal proofs. Roughly 90,000 lines of Isabel. So this J2JVM thing, this is the compiler. It transforms a J program, so a Jinja, which is an abbreviation for Jinja is not Java, but very like, very similar to Java, a source program from abstract syntax into a JVM program, which is again an abstract syntax thing. So the parser that Dmitri showed for his uh, brain fuck interpreter is not part of the whole thing you would have to do separately. Um, actually, that compiler J to JVM consists of two compilers. Um, first, a first phase and then a second phase. And the first phase essentially does some kind of very trivial register allocation for local variables. And the second phase actually does the, compi the compilation into bytecode um, in, in one go. And, well, there's then this notion of a memory model in, in Java. So as soon as you, you talk about concurrency, um, you see there is suddenly the problem where we don't have a deterministic program anymore. Or deterministic semantics, because depending on the interleaving, um, things will exhibit different behavior. So we can't really um, do this trick of, OK, let's just go down and prove determinism down here, because we don't have determinism down here. So we don't get the upwards direction for free. But the very, very same idea of having a simulation proof works here as well. And just because I uh, happen to have time, I did both directions. So this is a non-optimizing compiler, so it doesn't actually affect the non-determinism that, that is there. And uh, yeah, this is the theorem. So it gets a bit bigger, um, but if we look at it, uh, what is, is written there, well, what does it say? Well, if we have a, st a start state um, for our which, uh, for our Java interpreter. And we have the corresponding start state of the for the compiled program. So you're calling the method m in class p with parameters vs. So think of m as main and v is the string arguments. And the program it passes the type checker and is, is well formed. And the start state is also uh, correct. In particular, the method m exists in class c. And then, if we have such a run psi from this start state s, then there exists a, a state psi primed such that a bunch of properties holds. First of all, psi prime is an execution of the compiled program. And psi and psi prime, so this is basically what we consider as a behavior, they are, well, they satisfy this predicate. Um, which is a complicated statement of they producing the same output and they have the same memory uh, access patterns, essentially. And if the one thing terminates in a state S prime, which is really terminal, then the other thing terminates in the same state. Well, no, in a state that has the same exceptional behavior. If the one thing deadlocks, then the other thing deadlocks. And this is where um, the, the, the preservation in, uh, of, of non-determinism is essential. Because by reducing non-determinism, you can introduce deadlocks. Well, if the other thing doesn't terminate, then the other thing doesn't terminate. And so these are these two other properties that, that we have. So that's one simulation direction. The other one is symmetric. Um, for this part, it wasn't actually so much of a difference in effort whether we go down or up. The interesting point there is that the small step semantics in source code 
has so many sub-expression pro uh, propagation rules, so think of loop unrolling, that just is one stop that has no counterpart in the compiled bytecode. Um, exception handling in Java source code is formalized as, well, the exception essentially bubbles up to the handler in very, very many small steps. Whereas in bytecode you have an exception table and you directly jump to it. And that just introduces so many intermediate styles in the source code semantics that there's not that much difference anymore which direction you go. Um, but that's only the simulation, the simulations that I had proved for the, um, well, interleaving semantics. And then I set out to uh, look at the Java memory model. And the correctness theorem for the Java memory model, well, I then combined everything together. Uh, that's the theorem. Maybe let's uh, look at it in a more readable form. So again, we assume we have a well-formed program. And we have a well-formed uh, start state, now with respect to the Java memory model. And so if we have a legal execution of this program, uh, and the legal execution is basically given by this E and uh, WS, then the whole E and WS is a legal execution of the compiled program in the virtual machine. Right? So this is the if and only if that we have. And of course, this is based on the uh, simulation proofs that, that we have seen, except that the Java memory model sits on top of that and picks the the correct solutions. Right, how is that all done? Well, you can all do that very abstractly. So the whole simulation kind of business uh, you can formalize. Modularly, what happens is we have a transition system, one, another tr label transition system, two, a bi-simulation relation on the states, a bi-simulation bi relation on the uh, labels, and a classification which of the transitions are observable and which are not, and then a bunch of assumptions that you would expect to see, namely if I have two bisimilar states, one does an observable move, then there exists a sequence of unobservable moves and an observable move such that in the end we end up with something that's bisimilar again. And analogously, if you want to preserve the um, termination behavior, you say, okay, well, if I have an unobservable transition, then the other thing can do a bunch of unobservable transitions and you end up there. So standard weak by simulation strategy. Symmetrically for the, the other direction. And the divergence behavior is identical for by similar states. So you can, all, you can develop the whole theory in Isabel very abstractly and then actually apply that so, such that you only have to reason about the uh, individual steps that, that you look about. But this is actually where all the tedious work goes into um, that we had. Right, so um, if you ever want to use your own um, or want to verify your own compiler, uh, there is a rule of thumb like, yeah, don't hesitate to create many intermediate languages. So in Ginger Threads, I used one. We have seen that already. If we look at CompCert, the compiler from uh, C, C2 uh, assembly, we see that it actually has nine intermediate languages. So uh, in particular, those languages are re really some kind of language. It's not, ah, we use an abstract graph library uh, and work with that. That's not going to fly. You will just spend all your time telling the proof assistant to how to combine paths in the graph, and it will not get there. Um, the KML people, they have 10 intermediate languages. Uh, 
and 40-something uh, compiler passes. So they really went to the extreme of well, doing every modification in a separate pass, which actually makes the proof manageable because only very little or very, very defined thing changes in, in one go, uh, such that you as the one who has to do the proof actually can understand what is happening and can control the thing. And most of the cases are trivial. So by auto, as we had seen in Dimitri's proof, solves it. Auto only does the trivial things. Um, but you want not to spend your time on actually directing uh, the proof assistant when the case is actually trivial. OK, so questions? Yeah. Uh, do you ever consider to like prove the uh, like uh, compile and output is the same channel to read since you already like model the memory? I, uh, is, could, could you could you repeat? Yeah. So so what the compiler output? Uh, like the compile program, like the load out representation is the same channel to read. Okay, so I, I personally didn't do that. Um, the KML people actually prove that, well, the, the, the string of bytes they generate, if they load that into their assembly interpreter, actually gives the semantics that they have. So they really go to the assembly language. I only went to the Java virtual machine bytecode level. Um, and yeah, I mean, there, there, there are loads of things that would be changed, but Ginger Threads is, is by its name, not Java. So it would require a lot in order to actually serialize the output of the Ginger Threads compiler into valid Java class files. Because it's, it's leaving out loads of things. For example, it's leaving out um, string constants. Um, a lot of field modifiers, it's, it's really a conceptual model of uh, Java. It's not meant to be uh, a production compiler like the other big compiler project. Yep. You mentioned that any concept takes the approach of translation validation in some places. Yep. And where exactly? The can, is it, can you show the graphic for all the classes? Well, it's been, it's been a while. So I definitely know that they had a translation validation for, for register allocation. Um, I don't know whether they still have it. Um, I'm not sure about the expression decomposition phase. Maybe, but I mean, yeah, okay, so stack allocation of variables and these kind of things, I don't think they don't have that in there. But um, I, would, I would really have to check, up, check on, on what they really use, where. Um, probably they, uh, so, so initially I think the initial version by Xavier Leroy from 2006 had no translation validation whatsoever. Um, but then, well, they wanted to have better well, of these optimization things, and then um, more and more translation validation um, got added. And yeah, I'd, I'd have to look it up and read it up. But you probably can do it yeah. equally. More questions? OK, then I would suggest we have a short break. Yeah, let's have like five minutes. Uh, well, Johannes is setting up, and then we'll switch to Lean. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. So, you have a five minute break, then we have.